All right, Luke chapter number 15 in your Bibles, please. And uh, we'll begin reading in verse number one. It's kind of a, uh, a bit of a story here, but it kind of lays out uh, kind of where we are as far as, um, actually, we're going to kind of skip down in the chapter. I think we'll start down in verse, let's go to verse number 11. Uh, we will refer to some of the other parts in the lesson or in the chapter. Uh, Luke 15, and we'll start reading in verse number uh, 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and they began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him to, uh, into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain have filled his belly with the husk which was, that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when, his, when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go unto my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf. And he killed it and... Uh, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. We'll pause our reading right there. Let's pray, and we'll jump right into the lesson for this morning. Our Father, we do thank you for allowing us to be in your house today. Thank you for these that are in our class. I pray you'll bless our time together as we study the scriptures. When we look into a very important topic, I pray you'd help us to understand exactly what you have in mind for us. And I pray you'll bless our class, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of the lesson, as you see here, is What Does It Mean to Be Lost? I have some notes there about <clears throat> probably the most well-known song in our hymnal is Amazing Grace. Uh, I don't know if you know the story of the, uh, of the, of the song, uh, but everyone recognizes that song. And, and uh, the first verse reads, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found was blind, but now I see. And of course, John Newton was the songwriter. Uh, John Newton was a slave trader. <clears throat> Back in the 1800s, he drove, uh, he was captain of a slave ship, had grown up uh, <clears throat> around the things of God when he was a little boy, but then uh, he's, he got away from God and, and uh, well, he wasn't saved yet, but he, he got away from the things of God, was a slave trader, and uh, had a horrible, horrible uh, uh, job, of course, and then uh, years later, in, in the middle of that, somehow he ended up being on a slave ship in, in custody himself, and while he was on that, he remembered the things his mother told him about Christ and about being saved, and on that ship, he trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior, and he got saved, and then later on wrote this song, Amazing Grace, and uh, what an incredible song, but what does it mean to be lost <clears throat> and then found. Of course, Newton, uh, as it says in, in, uh, in our lesson here, that um, he was referring to the condition of all people before they trust Christ. Before we get saved, we are, the Bible says, lost. Uh, and, and so we're going to look this morning in our lesson, what does that mean? I think it's important for us to understand, for those of us that are saved, what we were before we got saved so we can understand what happened when God saved us. And so we're going to look at this, this subject of what it means to be lost. And, and you'll see in your notes there uh, on the top of the second page, I have a memory verse for you, Romans 5, 12. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The first thing we have to understand about being um, uh, being lost is that we are stained by sin. The issue that we have is we've broken God's law. 
Uh, that's what the word sin means. It means we've missed the mark. The word sin in the New Testament is actually an archery term. Any archers in here? You like to shoot bow and arrow? I do. And uh, I have a couple of compound bows. And um, to hit the bullseye is to hit the mark. If you miss that, that's the, what the word sin means. You miss the mark. And, and, and I like to word it this way is that <clears throat> all of us have broken God's law. For us to go to heaven by what we do, we'd have to be as good as Jesus. And none of us are that good, are we? No, if he, Jesus walked in the room this morning, we could not point our finger at him and say, Jesus, I'm as good as you are. But that's how good we'd have to be to go to heaven by what we do. We've all broken God's law. And that started back in the book of Genesis. In fact, keep your place here in Luke. But if you would look back at Genesis chapter number 3, Genesis chapter 3, we'll see what happened when man sinned and and broke God's law for the very first time. Genesis chapter number 3. Of course, we know the story beginning in verse number 1. Um, how the, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, and the Lord God had, that the, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not, touch, uh, you shall not eat of it, uh, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. And we'll pause right there. God never said you can't touch it. He said you can't eat it. So why is that important? Well, Adam's job was to take care of the garden. You can't take care of a tree if you're not touching it. So, um, so Eve here added to the word of God. The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. And for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her, unto her husband and, and with her, and he did eat. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and was afraid, because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, Who told thee thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, in sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto the Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles also, uh, thorns also and thistles shall bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. Till thou return into the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. What an amazing thing here. We see this, and uh, we see a little bit later on down in the verse number 22, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken and drove out the man and placed him at the east of the garden of, uh, of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So we see because man sinned, they broke God's law. There was a penalty and that was death. All right. We see that. And uh, to Adam, because of the curse, uh, Adam is going to have to live by the sweat of his brow. Uh, he cursed the ground for, for his sake. That means it's not going to produce like it did. There's going to be thorns and thistles. Uh, how many of you have a garden? Got any thorns out there? Thistles, that's what happens. All that's because of sin. To the woman, uh, to be sorrow and childbearing, her desire to be to her husband, husband will rule over her. And man was removed from the garden. We just read verses 23 and 24, where God kicked him out of the Garden of Eden. Why? Because of sin. It's very clear that all of us have sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned 
and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we are lost. There's some things that happen because of our sin. First of all, we are spiritually blind. And uh, I have that reference in your, your Bible there in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Or, yeah, 1 Corinthians 2. If you want to turn there, 1 Corinthians 2. And I'll begin reading in verse number 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, that's the man that's not saved, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually Discern. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. An important thing is given to us here. Because of our sin, before we're, we're saved, when we're still in our natural state, as a lost sinner, we're spiritually blind. It says right there that the natural man, verse 14, that's the man who's not saved. He cannot understand the things of God. Now you hear in this chapter, verse number 9 quoted all the time, and it's usually taken out of context. Uh, but as it is written, the eye hath not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. People will quote that and they'll use that to talk about heaven. That's not what that verse is talking about. What it's saying is not that we can't know about heaven, God describes that to us. What He's saying is before we come to, to know the Lord, we can't understand the Bible. You ever talk to somebody and say, well, I've read the Bible and I just can't understand it? Mm -hmm. Well, you can't understand it unless you have the Spirit of God living in you. That's what the latter part of the chapter is talking about. When we get saved, the Spirit of God moves in and He explains the Bible to us. You see, He's the one who wrote it, so He knows what He meant when He wrote it. I've written a couple books and uh, I've written some books on church growth and bus ministry and, and I've had a pastor call me and say, Brother Brambrink, I was reading your book on such and such. Could you explain this to me? Well, of course I can explain it. I wrote it. I know what I meant. Now, sometimes what I write down is not what's in my head. <laughs> God's not that way. His Word's perfect. But unless you're saved, you can't understand it. So before we come to know the Lord, we're spiritually blind. The things of God we do not understand. We're not under, able to understand the things of God. In fact, in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, verse 4, uh, the Bible says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Before we get saved, we can't understand the Bible. That's why it's so important to have a soul winner, somebody who takes the Bible who is saved and explains it to somebody who's not saved. Uh, that's why we don't just hand somebody a track. We want to talk to them. We want to go through the Scriptures with them and explain them. Why? Because we have the Spirit of God in us. We can explain to them. Uh, man, I wish I had time to go to a... Uh, well, we're going to go. Go to Acts chapter number 8. We'll do it real fast. Acts 8. We'll see this illustrated for us. Acts chapter 8 is a wonderful, wonderful story. <clears throat> and, of course, the first part of the chapter is is Saul of Tarsus, is persecuting the church, and, uh, and, and uh, you see all of that going on. But in, in Acts chapter 8, you see Philip, one of the seven men chosen. Uh, we'd normally call them deacons. Um, he's out uh, preaching in the city of Samaria, uh, and multitudes are getting saved, and God sends him out into the desert. And uh, we see that in verse number, uh, let's see here. Verse number 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship. I'm going to pause right there. He was in Jerusalem for the feasts. There were several feasts that they used. Uh, the feast of uh, of uh, 
uh, of uh, uh, Passover. Of course, that's right when Jesus died. He died just before Passover. And then 50 days later, you have the Feast of Pentecost. And those that were Jewish followers, would go. To, the men would go to Jerusalem for those feasts. He was there for those feasts. He was studying. He was, he was le- learning. In fact, it goes on to say uh, <clears throat> that, uh, uh, let's see, verse number 28. So he's coming back from Jerusalem, headed back to Ethiopia. It says, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. That's Isaiah. Then saith the Spirit unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest what thou readest. So here's a man reading Isaiah 53 out loud while he's driving his chariot. It's just an amazing thing to think about. And Philip hears him. Philip's running next to this chariot. Picture this in your mind. And he asks him, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I? Except some man should guide me. He said, I need somebody to teach me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb before, uh, lamb dumb before his shears. So he opened out his mouth in his humiliation. His judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? That's Isaiah 53. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? That's a good question. Who's he talking about? And Philip, verse 35, this is my life verse, then Philip opened his mouth, began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. So he takes Isaiah 53 and explains to him, this is talking about Jesus and his crucifixion. Now notice what he says in uh, uh, verse number 36, and as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, he had the gospel explained to him. We see in this verse, he had put his faith in Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the Messiah. He came to die for our sins. He put his faith in him. Verse 38, And then he, that's Stephen, commanded the, the chariot to stand still. And they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So here's a man, he gets saved. He'd been reading the Bible, but needed someone to explain it. Why? Because when you're not saved, you can't understand the Bible. When you're saved, you can, because the Spirit of God lives inside of you. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, I think this reference is, um, I've got the reference there in your notes. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the, the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, which is the blindness of their heart. Before we got saved, we cannot explain and understand the Scriptures. We're spiritually blinded. And that's why Jesus used the commonplace to explain that which is difficult. Right? So he would use, like in the story that we looked at last week in John chapter 3, with uh, ye must be born again. Remember that? He explained the salvation as a new birth, and, and he used what was common to explain the spiritual. So before you get saved, the, to be lost means that you're spiritually blind. Second of all, if you look at your notes, number two, we're lost in sin. Isaiah 53, 6, the Bible says, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every one of us, before we got saved, we were out in sin. We did what we wanted. We went our own way. We didn't go God's way. We, we made up our own mind. We did our own thing. You ever talk to somebody and say, well, I, you know, I have my own religion. Ever heard that? I've got my own way. Well, your own way is going to take you to hell. Right? You can only come God's way to go to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And so John, in Romans chapter 3, you're there in Acts. Just go to Romans, a couple pages to the right there. The book of Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, verses we all know well. Romans 3, 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That word righteous means to do right all the time. Anybody here do right all the time? No, we don't, because we're sinners. Right? We have that old nature. Uh, notice verse 13 of Romans 3, where God describes um, what sin looks like to Him. It says, Their throat is an open sepulcher, 
With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. So he's describing what sin looks like. It's an open wound. It's, uh, we're deceitful. Uh, it's like a, a serpent. Isaiah chapter 1, I think I've got the reference there. Isaiah 1, verse 5, Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that they have not closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Here when God's describing this, He's describing sin. He's not describing a sick physical body. But when God looks at our sin, that's what He sees. We are lost in sin. In Luke 15, where we started, uh, in fact, if you'll turn back there, I ask you to put a marker there. Luke 15, the term lost in describing us, we see there's three things that were lost. First of all, uh, the part we didn't read, starting in verse 1, it's talking about a man having a hundred sheep. You see in verse 4, if he lose one, will he not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. When he had found it, he layeth it on his shoulder, rejoicing. When he cometh, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. Uh, so we have the, the lost sheep that's carelessly lost. It just got lost, didn't mean to, but it did. Before we got saved, we were carelessly lost. We just, we weren't close to God. The next part of it, he talks about a woman with a coin. Uh, verse number 8, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she had found it, she called her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I, ha which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. This one is unconsciously lost. This lady was just going about her business and lost a coin. You ever lost something in your house? You know you have it, but you can't find it. Oh, yeah, I do that all the time. I do it with my glasses. I do it with my keys. <laughs> I do it just phone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the worst part of it, I know none of you have ever done this one. Ron, have you seen my phone? Anybody ever done that? Go ahead and admit. I'm admitting it on camera. You can admit it. Oh, yeah. Where's my phone? In your hand. And I just turn and I walk out of the room. You know, I just <laughs> unconsciously lost. Before you and I got saved, we didn't even realize we were lost away from God. And then we see this last one, the son, he's willfully lost. He comes to his father and says, give me my inheritance. And his father gives it to him and he leaves and wastes it in living. The Bible says riotous living. That literally means living free from restraint. He's just out living any way he wants to. He's wasted his money on prostitutes. He's wasted it on, on booze. He's just throwing a party all the time. He runs out of money and he ends up in a hog pen. And he's eating with the hogs because he can't get any of the food. All right? and, and he says, why, why am I doing this? You know, he talks about how that, uh, his, his father's servants do better than he's doing. And, and so he realized that he was lost. But how did he get lost? He did it on purpose. The truth is, before we got saved, we were all three of those conditions. We were willfully lost, we were unconsciously lost, and we were carelessly lost. We were separated from God. And that's, I'm going to just touch on this one, number three there, look at it. Uh, we are separated from God in Ephesians 4.18. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Before we got saved... We are alienated from the life of God. We're separated from Him. We read there in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, a couple things happened. The first thing is, God kicked them out of the garden. Right? When they were in the garden, they were fellowshipping with Him. They were in perfection. They had everything they needed. They fellowshiped with God every day in the cool of the day. God would come down and He would, he would meet with Adam. He would talk with them. But then they sinned. And all of that ended. And uh, in verse 23 of Genesis uh, 3, it says that the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. Verse 24 says, so he drove out the man. Adam and Eve had to leave the garden. They were separated. That's what sin does. It separates us from God. It does it in this life. But it also does it eternally. In, um, uh, let's see, Revelation chapter number 20. 
Revelation 20 and verses 11 through 15. The Bible says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Yes, the, pay, the wages of sin is death. My body's going to die. If I don't trust Christ, my body will die. Then I, my spirit and soul will be separated from God forever in a place called hell. That's the worst part about, about being lost, though, is, is not all the other stuff you miss. It's the fact you're separated from God's person forever. That's what happens because of sin. We are separated from God. I'm going to stop right there. I had intended to get through all of these today, but there's just no time, and I don't want to go any farther. I would ask you to read those verses coming up for the next few, so we can talk about that next week. But before you got saved, there's several things going on. Uh, you are, um, you're spiritually blind. You don't understand the things of God. You're lost in sin. You're away from God. You're separated from Him. Next week, we'll talk about you're actually God's enemy. We'll look at that. Not just that He's displeased with you. You're His enemy. We'll talk about that in great detail. You say, why are you spending all this time? I've already trusted Christ as my Savior. It's important to understand what God saved you from. If you look there in Luke 15, again, if you're still there, let me just, I'll just read it for you again. It says about the, 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 young, the, the young man who had separated from his dad, had gone out, lived any way he wanted to, wasted his, his fortune, He's now living on a hog farm. Now, of course, Jews were not allowed to eat, eat pork. And where is he? He's living with the pigs. Right? Wrong place for him to be. And it says in verse number 20, uh, 17, when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Before the son ever got to go back home, before the father ever received him, before the father ever had the feast, the son had to realize where he was. And he had to then turn and come to his father. By the way, we call that repentance. We'll talk about that in another lesson. But he realized where he was. And that's why it's important for us to study. Before we got saved, we weren't just good people. No, we were wicked people away from God. We were God's enemy, and, and we were against Him, and we were separated from Him, but because of Christ, we're reconciled. We'll talk about that next week. Let's pray. We've got to, it's time to go to church. Amen. Father, thank You for the opportunity to be in class today. I pray You'd help us. We've covered this very quickly, but I pray You'd help us to understand where we were when You found us. We were blinded spiritually. We couldn't understand the things of God. We were in sin we were, we, we were in such a condition that we were separated from you, but thank you for loving us. Father, I pray you'd help us this week to point somebody else to the Lord Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.